Greetings, Starfighters. Welcome to the next episode of Shameless Cash Grab. And we're doing something special with this one, because this is a first for these uh, sets that I've gotten, in that uh, the next two movies in the set, the latter is a direct sequel to the former. So since that's never happened before, and since I like to do things a little differently when I come across a unique situation in these videos, like sometimes I have a guest, or I do something really extreme, like filming at the opposite end of this room. But for this episode, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about Savage Beach, then return to Savage Beach, all in the same audio. Hopefully that'll fill just one episode. Actually, it probably will. It turns out that uh, the, the YouTube time limit, not really an issue for me anymore. I mean, geez, did any of you see how long my, some of my uh, Dream Daddy Let's Play videos were? But anyway, enough about that. Savage Beach, return to Savage Beach. Let us once again enter the world of Andy Sedaris. Sorry this one took so long, folks. Um... I decided to do my long overdue rewatch of Twin Peaks, and that kind of ate up a lot of the time that I could have been spending watching these movies to do this show. I actually made the right choice, as it turns out, but let's get into that. First up, 1989's Savage Beach. Plot summary courtesy of Letterboxd.com. You can follow me there, by the way. Link to my account is in the show notes. Donna and Taryn. Yes, the same Donna and Taryn from Hard Ticket to Hawaii, are federal drug enforcement agents based in the Hawaiian Isles. Upon the success of a drug bust, they receive a call from Shane Aviation to fly an emergency package of vaccine from Molokai to Knox Island. Unbeknownst to them, Philippine Representative Martinez has convinced Captain Andreas to use a reconnaissance satellite to locate a sunken ship laden with gold that the Japanese had pilfered during World War II. Meanwhile, a storm forces Donna and Taryn to land their plane on a remote island which harbors the gold. The hijinks ensue and they are joined by a host of nefarious types who have learned of the gold's location. We return to the world of the Lethal Ladies, the name of this series of films that included Hard Ticket to Hawaii, but based on what I found wasn't actually named that until after Hard Ticket came out. How does this one stack up in the sub edits good department? Does it match the level of cheese of Hard Ticket? Does the fact that this movie opens with a logo that resembles the World War II-era Japanese flag and a silhouette of a guy practicing with a katana on the beach mean I can expect a lot of casual racism and possibly even fear of a Japanese economic takeover since this movie was made in the 80s? Will Arkle stop asking questions and just talk about the damn movie already? So after being incredibly vague in the previous film I reviewed, we finally get a name for the organization Donna and Taryn work for. That's going to be changed in a future film, but... Let's not worry about that right now. The Drug Enforcement Division. Not Drug Enforcement Agency, Drug Enforcement Division. I guess they couldn't get the rights to use the name, so it's Drug Enforcement Division here. I guess after a bust, they go and order a beer brand beer and drink it at the local bar named Bar. Okay, that joke was a bit of a stretch, I'm sorry. Seriously, though, I can't say I blame the DEA for concerns about association. I doubt they'd want audiences to think that like Donna and Taryn, they would resort to using a car bomb to stop the bad guys from getting away in the opening act. I mean, they probably do. DEA does some shady shit, but they don't want people to think about it. Back on the topic of the movie, though, one thing I can say for certain is that the acting hasn't improved any in the two years between Hard Ticket and Savage Beach. Though I imagine the fact that we only have two returning cast members, though we do have characters who are relatives of ones from Hard Ticket, uh, that might have had something to do with it. And as you probably surmised from the plot summary I gave at the start of this portion of the episode, this movie has a much more straightforward plot. Pretty early on in the movie, I could tell that dialing back the crazy of the previous film was a mistake, and the movie managed to not disappoint me by disappointing me. Yes, that sentence makes sense, just think on it for a second. Savage Beach has a lot of the same elements that made Hard Ticket to Hawaii what it was, but it just doesn't blend them together quite as well. I suppose that's to be expected, though. It was probably unreasonable to expect that film's unique brand of crazy to be easily copied. 
And although Savage Beach doesn't live up to its predecessor, it does still manage to garner some laughs, so it's not a total wash. I mean, the double entendres alone. There are so many of them, I would advise against making a drinking game of it, because you'll need a new liver before the movie's even a third of the way through. And the nudity was certainly dialed up. I was actually more worried about the relatives I live with walking in on me watching this one than I ever was during Hard Ticket, and that's saying something, considering how much TNA that movie had. And while there was some casual racism, it wasn't as bad as I feared. It was more of the positive stereotyping variety. You know, like when someone just assumes all black people are good at basketball? In their head, they think they aren't being racist because, hey, being good at basketball is a good thing, right? In this movie's case, it's got a lot of the romanticization. That was only the second take on that word, by the way, uh, <laughs> of the samurai going on. But all things considered, it could have been way worse. I mean, at least the accents, while inaccurate, at least as far as I could tell, they weren't comically exaggerated. And they also cast actual Asian actors to play Asian characters. So no, the samurai in the opening bit of the movie was not played by Scarlett Johansson. I get into this a bit more in the final verdict section, which I'll actually do for both of these movies at once. But what drags Savage Beach down in the end is that it tries to be a serious drama and a cheesy TNA action movie at the same time, and consequently drops the ball on both. Honestly, that it's as amusing to watch as it is seems downright miraculous. And frankly, most of the fun parts are in the second half, by which point anyone who wasn't either a hardcore fan of the franchise or someone who has to watch the whole movie for their ampersand list YouTube show would have checked out. Especially amusing is the connection that one of the Japanese soldiers who was carrying the stolen Filipino gold has to Taryn's grandfather. Yes, really. To bring back an old joke, man, the plucked Venus fairy has just given him away. I think I will skip the details on that one in case you decide to see this movie for yourself, if you haven't. But the short, short version is a bunch of coincidences. You get all the characters together on the island. They find the gold. The end. Random thoughts I had while watching the movie. Six minutes, 34 seconds on the time to tits counter. While this is only my second Andy Sidaris film, based on what I've heard about the others, this almost counts as restraint. I mean, remember, Hard Ticket of Hawaii is less than a minute and a half. Speaking of Hard Ticket, while well, that movie had some clumsy exposition scenes, compared to Savage Beach, it was practically Carrie Pratchett. Speaking of clumsy, uh, this movie has one of the clumsiest title drops I've ever heard. And I've seen the Lord of the Rings movies. Oh, don't boo. I love those movies, too, but the scenes where Ian McKellen says the title of each film... Well, okay, the one in Fellowship of the Ring works okay, but the other two... They are just so forced, even he can't make it work. And still, in the clumsy department, the old age makeup on the actor playing the Japanese soldier who had been living alone on an island for 40 years is some of the worst old age work I've ever seen. And I've seen Prometheus. The ADR in this movie is worse than in Hard Ticket to Hawaii. I didn't even comment on the ADR in the Hard Ticket episode. That is how noticeable the difference is. Lastly, before moving on to Return to Savage Beach, I'll give them props for doing what a lot of movies with treasure hunting plots or subplots don't. This movie remembers that gold bars are really freaking heavy. And with that, we go to this film's direct sequel, although there were a bunch of movies in between, 1998's Return to Savage Beach. This plot summary is courtesy of IMDb, and honestly, it was the best one I could find, or at least the best one I could find that was not written by someone who clearly likes boobs and wants the world to know it. A stolen computer floppy disk filled with information about the location of a mythical treasure in Savage Island will lure both villains and lethal agents into a dangerous treasure hunt. Whoever wrote that summary for IMDb... It's called Savage... Yeah, forget it. 
You know, this whole more in-depth summaries thing I've been trying to do all season hasn't been working out all that well, has it? I may have to give up on that. But anywho, thanks to this movie, or rather, le thanks to the letterboxed entry of this movie, I finally know what the lethal in Lethal Ladies, the name of this franchise I'm on the third consecutive movie for, means. <laughs> oh, you, you, dig, 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 dig this one. Legion to ensure total harmony and law. Wow, that is one painful backronym, isn't it? They should have put the money spent on the consultant who came up with that one into security for their offices. I mean, it speaks ill of your massive counterterrorism group, and, oh, yeah, they fight terrorists now, too, apparently. But I'm sure that was haphazardly explained in one of the in-between movies that's not on this Mill Creek set. It, it speaks ill of your massive counterterrorism group when you can be robbed by one lady with a pair of roller skates and a sexy pizza delivery driver outfit from Yandy. Yes, I know Yandy didn't exist yet in 1998. It's a joke. Anyway, not only was this the 12th and final film in the Lethal Lady series, this apparently was Andy Sedaris' last film altogether. So did he end his career on a high note? Well, the deck was certainly stacked against it. This sequel to Savage Beach came nine years later, with a bunch of movies released between the two, so one wonders why do a follow-up in the first place. Also, it has only one of the characters from Savage Beach, who shouldn't even be alive, let alone ambulatory, but I'll get into that later, so that's a thing against the movie as well. Now, in the interest of fairness, there's a germ of an interesting idea in the opening act, where information is passed to agents by way of coded language put out on radio by way of a relationship and sex advice radio show. Sex advice radio show. That almost sounded like I said sex. These didn't have cell phones back then. Uh, I swear, English is my first language, folks. But an interesting idea can only carry you so far. I mean, Stephanie Meyer, of all people, had one in Twilight, with the whole secondary powers thing, but that certainly didn't save those books from being what they were. Where Return to Savage Beach falls apart is most obvious in the scene after the lethal office in Dallas, Texas is robbed by Pizza Lady, apparently in real time, based on how the opening act established their satellite worked, which is not how satellites actually work, but whatever. The scene has, you know, several of the main characters watching this happen, but they didn't bother to actually put anything out on the air to their other agents until after the fact. The idiot ball is in full effect here, folks. But going back to the opening act for a moment, the first real scene of dialogue in the movie is so badly acted, it makes the previous two movies look like The Godfather by comparison. But, you know, nobody comes to an Andy Sedaris movie for the acting anyway. We come for the batshit crazy, the over-the-top action, and if you happen to be into that sort of thing, the boobs. And you've also got plenty of that in the first scene, too. No one is actually nude, so the time to tits counter doesn't apply to this scene. But Julie Strain's bikini is small enough to almost count. Yes, that Julie Strain. An actress known mainly for two things. Hey, phrase it! I mean doing a lot of cheesy movies and having been married to one of the co-creators of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, you dinks. Get your minds out of the gutter. Ultimately, although the raw elements for a cheesy, so bad it's good action movie were there, this movie is just a dud. While watching, I wanted to take back some of the complaints I had about the original Savage Beach. Honestly, the whole movie just felt like Andy Sedaris had stopped trying. I mean, at one point, the movie comes to a screeching halt to give us a two-minute-long, clunky recap of the, the events of the previous movie. Uh, I, mean, I mean the previous Savage Beach movie, not the previously the ladies movie. And the bad guy from that movie is back looking not too terrible for someone who got blown the fuck up in the last one. I mean, the last Savage Beach, not that... Okay, this is getting confusing. The point is, the guy who got, as previously stated, blown the fuck up, is back now, nine years later, with just a small mask covering up some minor burn scars. Or, another way to put it, the worst Phantom of the Opera cosplay job since Gerard Butler. 
He's also apparently not the only bad guy from a previous Lethal Ladies movie to come back for this one, but the other one works with the good guys now, and the explanation for why he is seems like bullshit, but not having seen whatever movie in the series he's from, I can't confirm that. By the way, all this stuff I've been griping about? This is just the first third of the movie. It doesn't really get much better from there. Return to Savage Beach is by far the weakest of the Andy Sedaris movies on this set. Better than the shitty comedies I had to watch on disc 1, but a poor way to close out disc 2. While a handful of scenes managed to eke their way up to the level of Hard Ticket to Hawaii, for the most part, Return to Savage Beach rests on the bad side of the bad-so-bad-it's-good dividing line. And that's even with the Scooby-Doo ending. The ending was cheesy in a fun way, but not cheesy enough to make up for all the bleh that preceded it. Random thoughts I had while watching this movie. Uh, the counter? Four minutes and 34 seconds. So, longer than Hard Ticket, not as long as Savage Beach. Not particularly important. While not intentional, I'm sure, there's a moment where it looks like Julie Strain is nodding along with the movie's soundtrack. That was funny. Do bras just not exist in the universe of these films? I know that I was, at least in theory, supposed to be aroused by a lot of these sequences, but I honestly spent much of the time empathizing over all the chafing that must have been going on during filming. By the way, there is so much silicone in this movie, I think it could double as a flotation device in the event of a water landing. I did get a small kick out of how the file folder in Lethal's office about the events of Savage Beach used the same font as the logo for that movie on it. Not the best meta joke I've ever seen, but still kind of clever. At least by this movie's standards, anyway. So, why exactly did Return to Savage Beach decide to give the main villain of Savage Beach a sympathetic backstory? There was nothing in Savage Beach to suggest that the guy who fired off a one-liner after blowing up someone he was supposed to be banging, and who planned to use the gold he was looking for to overthrow his own government, was a good man who'd gone bad, like Return suddenly tells us he was, even going so far as to have one of our male heroes wearing a medallion that said villain had given this hero's father. So I'm guessing the direction given to the film's composer for the odd driving-slash-pole-dancing montage was make it as close to Bachman Turner Overdrive's taking care of business as you can without getting sued. In a better movie, the scene with the RC cars rigged with explosives might have been fun. Instead, well, at least the first one was just convoluted and not worth the boom. The second one, eh, slightly better, but not by much. Apparently, both the good guys and the bad guys in this movie went to the Imperial Stormtrooper Marksman Academy. I've never held a real gun in my life, and I bet I could shoot better than these federal agents or ninjas. Yes, ninjas, you heard me. Last random thought. For all my gripes, at least the closing credits song was funny. Credit where credit is due. Final verdicts. For Savage Beach, its ultimate failure comes from taking itself too seriously. It tries to eat its cake and have it too, dialing up the nudity and the camp from Hard Ticket, but not until the second half, and definitely not as much as Return to Savage Beach, but I'll get to that in a moment, while having a straightforward dramatic plot complete with somber music and character-relevant flashbacks. It's a little like if someone took a botched attempt at an Oscar bait drama and spliced in scenes from a softcore porn into it every 20 minutes or so. While the acting in Hard Ticket was hardly stellar, at least the main cast made up for their lack of talent with enthusiasm and charisma, very little of which is on display here, apart from Donna Spear and Hope Marie Carlton, the only actors to reprise their characters. I certainly missed seeing those two in Return to Savage Beach. At least the movie had the decency to remember they existed. For Return to Savage Beach, take all the problems I had with Savage Beach and dial them up to 11. This movie fails because it did what I wanted Savage Beach to do, except it did it so poorly it made me regret that I wanted it. Season 4 of Heroes all over again. 
So while I didn't enjoy Savage Beach as much as I did Hard Ticket to Hawaii, I'd honestly choose it over Return to Savage Beach. In fact, at several points while watching Return to Savage Beach, I considered going back and rewriting what I'd written for the first one, but I decided that since this isn't a true review show anyway, but simply my initial reactions to these movies, that wouldn't be necessary. By the way, remember when I said that Savage Beach had more nudity than uh, Hard Ticket to Hawaii? Return to Savage Beach goes even further than that. Kind of goes to my point earlier about Sidaris not even trying anymore. Without the goofy, over-the-top action sequences to balance it out, this movie comes across as way more exploitative than the other two. I honestly felt a little oily watching it. I mean, the movie actually stops at one point, just... It just stops, so we can have a look at one of the main characters' sexual fantasies. Why? Because the Kool-Aid Man is red. I don't fucking know. If Sedaris was trying to make a parody of his own work with this one, it fell flat. So, thus ends our time in the world of Andy Sedaris and the Lethal Ladies. What's up next for Shameless Cash Grab? Well, if the plot summary for this movie, 1982's The Beach Girls, is any indication, it's a movie that contains one of the most obnoxious tropes in all of film. But as my dad used to say, we'll burn that bridge when we cross it.